talk to you then. Don't go away. There's a panel discussion now. Uh, now I'm calling on stage uh, people who will take part in our roundtable that's going to be focused on the research point of view. We have researchers from international organizations with uh, foresight and projections on food security. So let us welcome Sally Bunning. Patrick Meffroy and Michael Obersteiner. I hope I didn't mispronounce your names. Meffroy, it's the right way to pronounce uh, your name and Mr. Michael Obersteiner. Okay. Austrian. Sally Bunning. Yes, don't change, uh, don't change languages at the, in the middle of a sentence. Uh, Sally Bunning, your land management officer in Rome Land and Water Division. Patrick Meffroy, you're a researcher in the George Met Center for Earth and Climate Change, Climate Research in the University Catholique de Rouvain, and Michael Oberstromer, you're uh, in charge of the program called Ecosy Ecosystem Services and Management in Vienna. So I'll give you the floor. Uh, first, each of you, apparently you're not at all shy, you're very willing to ask questions. So let's start with you, Sally Bunning. Can you remind us about your research work and what are your areas uh, that you want to focus on in the discussion? Just speak in the microphone. Okay. I work with FAO. I've worked f here for more than 20 years. I've always worked on land management and water management, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. I have a few comments. I think that this process is extremely interesting, but I'm wondering whether we should carry out, we should have carried out this uh, analysis at the level of landscape and uh, territories and uh, smaller scale regions, because it, already in a small region, you have a high diversity of uh, types of agriculture, high level of diversity of socioeconomic contexts. We've been working uh, for years on uh, the assessment of uh, land deterioration, but we're using approaches uh, based on experts' knowledge in order to map this degradation based on knowledge. This has been very useful to draw maps and next to discuss with political decision makers about investment in land management uh, in response to this degradation. And one comment is that Degradation is a very complex issue, and this might require deeper uh, analysis, further analysis. Is it because of salinization, loss of nutrients, loss of carbon, and so on? This type of analysis should uh, bolster this study. What are the impacts on the ecosystem services? I think that hasn't been in, uh, analyzed uh, enough. We would be ready to uh, continue this type of exercise with you uh, on the, in the countries 
in more decentralized regions. We have a project called World Agriculture Watch that's actually analyzing uh, types, different types of farmers, and deep in the analysis to characterize the types of, agri of farmers in that country. We also developed scenarios, for example, the scenario for the RLC, uh, the RLC basin. What are the impacts of political change from the Soviet type regime to the national policies in Central Asia? What are the exam the impacts on the energy food nexus? We're finding very, very interesting scenarios, and we'd like to share this work with you because I believe that some elements in there were interesting and were not taken on board in your analyses. Is that enough for now? Or you can speak uh, a little longer if you want, maybe just five, ten minutes each first, and then a discussion with the room, with the um, audience. Then uh, degradation and typology of farmers, I've covered those two points. We believe that land availability is not there quite yet. And we believe that there's a problem with land availability. If there's an expansion of arable land that will occur in very vulnerable and very fragile and marginalized uh, land, because that's the only remaining land, so the yields would be very low or would require very significant investment for irrigation. And also, these areas are very often remote areas, far from markets. So do we have investment there? Because there, there, there are funds, but more for areas that are closer to urban areas or for f more fertile lands area. I mean, it's, there's the issue of land grab, but when you look at the issue of land grab, many uh, lands were distributed by governments that weren't really available because they were used for pasture. So if we see an expansion of farmland, who's going to have to leave their land? Uh, people who rely on pasture land or, I mean, you, you're talking about deforestation, but do we prefer having, do we prefer promoting uh, sustainable pastoralism, sustainable management with crop and, uh, and livestock? Or do we prefer single crop cultivation and land expansion and uh, farmland? Ex so I, I'd rather have this uh, um, sustainable pastoralism more developed. Finally, on governance, if we categorize the land use systems, I'd like to focus more on human aspects. Human management is as much uh, as important as land and water management, unless we have a community uh, planning on land, on territories, unless we have uh, an adequate uh, management on micro um, uh, mi micro basins and uh, manage. We, we are never going to meet our requirements, our food requirements, to uh, reduce food insecurity that's currently affecting a billion people. In the, na in the last 50 years, we've seen a reduction in uh, land available per capita. Uh, can we go further yet? I don't think so. There's a uh, we're seeing uh, rural exodus, people leaving the countries 
the rural areas and moving to cities. And it's even worse in remote areas. So who is going to invest in these areas? There are many, many governance issues that should take that into account. Um, uh, I mean, there's the biophysic aspect, but we, I, I think, need to focus more on human dimensions in order to have a more uh, inclusive, socially inclusive approach. I think uh, that I will stop here because I have um, shared many ideas, but maybe not many solutions. But we do have solutions. Um, I'll tell you more about them uh, later. Patrick Meffroy, you have a, uh, 10 minutes for a presentation. Um, I'm not used to spend my uh, time congratulating people, but since I was in the uh, scenarios um, committee, I would like to highlight uh, the work that was done and to congratulate the team. I mean, as, when you support the process, you realize initially the perspective was to have a systemic vision of the interplay between the, the many elements that are, that come into play in these uh, issues. So it started going in all direction, and it was it really took a lot of work to build consistent, constructed scenarios that are internally consistent. So I, I really wanted to commend this work. This uh, takes me to one thing that I wanted to say about this work. There is a significant amount of work that was done um, to embrace the complexity of the world, but as Sally just said, uh, it's only touching some aspects. There are many, many other perspectives that should be brought on board. But there's a huge amount of work that was done uh, to take into account players, uh, more local dy dynamics, a more bottom-up approach based on uh, enabling players uh, producers, consum consumers, households, citizens, local communities, all these grassroots uh, players were really involved in uh, the development of scenarios. The scenarios were really developed uh, while thinking of what these players do, could do, should do, and so on. So these scenarios really dig into this complexity in diets and so on and so forth. And th I think that's w one of the strengths of this exercise that doesn't stop at, you know, demographics, economic growth, climate change, the big, the usual suspects. But if you want to draw the lessons uh, from it, I think uh, the Scenario Advisory Committee involved many, many field uh, actors who really brought this bottom-up dimension. So from this uh, scenario development uh, pathway, we came up with more nuanced scenarios that are maybe a little more complex than uh, the scenarios in some other uh, such projects. And this makes them very rich, but sometimes also a little more difficult to comprehend, to understand. So Olivier uh, did this uh, analysis to, to really understand and make them more palatable, more understandable for the users, such as you, who really want to use uh, the output of our work, I encourage the, you to deep, dig deep into the understanding of the scenarios and uh, really grasp the complexity and the nuance, because I think it's really important not to limit yourself to the superficial aspects of the scenarios. Then I wanted to 
say a few things about the perspective. Uh, what should be the next outlook exercise? Some, there's one aspect that has been uh, mentioned along the work was the question of pathways. We're seeing with this in the scenarios and the there are, we, we are starting to see the possible outcomes, but there is uh, uh, there are significant differences, uh, you know, in terms of land use, food security. But there is issue that we have very little knowledge on: is how do we move from one scenario to another? What is feasible? We talked a lot about food diets. We know that it's one of the aspects, one of the drivers uh, of you know, something that leads to significant differences between the scenarios. At this stage, we have very little knowledge in terms of what are the drivers, politically, economically, and so on, what are the drivers we can use, the levers uh, that we can use to really uh, create change in diets, and how um, uh, the intensity of the use of these levers that we should uh, apply in order to make uh, diets healthier, and so on and so on. So we mentioned this, I mean, we discussed this uh, along the process. I mean, it was part of this c work on the internal consistency of scenarios. Uh, you know, we needed to build a pathway, a trajectory uh, to, along with all the scenarios, but there is still a large amount of work that needs to be done in terms of understanding what are the drivers we could use or the, the tools or the uh, action instruments. Since I have a few minutes left, I'd like to highlight a f couple of things in terms of land use. These scenarios quantitatively give an idea of uh, land use change, possible or imaginable change, net change. But when it comes to deforestation and environmental impact, we should also look at gross change, not just net change. Some, sen some scenarios have very different impacts. For example, metropolization with a uh, shift towards uh, ultra-processed food has very little impact in terms of net change, but since it's highly integrated in terms of international trade, it probably requires a redistribution or optimization and so on, but it can lead to gross change, deforestation, uh, farmland expansion in some place, in some sub-regions, countries, and some other lands would be uh, wouldn't be used at all. So there's uh, there's a gross change more than a net change. Um, a final point. Clearly, there's a, a, a like a black, a dark spot in the map. Uh, it's the question of livestock systems how they change the data, the data on land use. If we want to quantify meadow area on the planet, we have no idea. Let's be clear about this. We don't know because how do we define meadow? How many cows per square kilometer, over what period uh, does it need to be used as meadow to be qualified as meadow and so on? So there are uh, many questions as to are these scenarios realistic in terms of livestock systems? But clearly what they're suggesting is that in intensive uh, 
systems, we they lead to pressure on land in most scenarios that are unrealistic. So these scenarios are unrealistic, but we're going to in a direction that cannot be sustained uh, likewise. Thank you. Michael Oberstein, are you going to speak French or English? I think, bonjour. <laughs> Systems, uh, services, and management. Tout le monde a le casque ou uh, vous comprenez l'anglais. Uh, this is an international organism or a multilateral uh, organism uh, which is to do with research about uh, things like demography, climate change, uh, water resources, and uh, land resources. And you've developed a model called Globium. Uh, maybe you're going to tell us about that, or what would be your, uh, the points uh, that uh, you would like to raise in your introductory comments? Uh, okay. Um, well, maybe I can uh, immediately start uh, with the questions which uh, came to the previous podium, uh, and thereby somehow also explain a little bit what we are doing. So the first point was on, on biomass and bioenergy, and uh, the scenarios which we have seen uh, you record all of this, or sh shall I interrupt? Okay, I, I just continue. Okay. Uh, there is a okay. consecutive translation. Okay. No, 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 you, uh, okay. you just talk. Ça marche la traduction, vous avez traduction dans les casques. Okay. Uh, Don't worry, everything uh, is. And what we see is uh, kind of a big difference between the IPCC scenarios uh, and uh, uh, the Agrimont scenarios is that especially in, in the good climate world, we see much more biomass, almost triple amount of biomass uh, used. And, uh, and so here the, the, the pressures are not really comparable. And this is something uh, I, I would wish personally to see less biomass in these uh, two degree stabilization scenarios, but the entire literature shows this. So this is one of the big differences. Um, the other uh, comment was on, on livestock. Um, we uh, concluded the study for Brazil uh, on deforestation and, uh, and what we found is the deforestation in Brazil cannot be explained uh, uh, without taking into account the, the, the import by, by China uh, in terms of soy. Uh, and also uh, other, other uh, agricultural products. So, so there is definitely this, this teleconnection. And, uh, 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 but also, uh, when you look at the solution side uh, on stopping deforestation, uh, you really see that the livestock uh, uh, sector is taking center stage. That's really where you get, uh, where you get the benefit. And uh, here comes also a little bit of a criticism. It's mostly the livestock system uh, changes, so where you actually go away from the pastures and go to more mixed and uh, even landless systems uh, in order to avoid the deforestation and also avoid the, the, the expansion into, into grasslands. Uh, so this is definitely the, the follow-up study of this study to, to really look into these endogenous changes. And then uh, the, the third question was on, on, on water. And uh, we are currently uh, conducting a study which is not uh, published yet, where we look at environmental flows in rivers, so in, in, in still on the, on the terrestrial domain. And if you uh, take care of basically the, the, the fish still swimming in the rivers because you don't uh, take so much uh, uh, irrigation water out, uh, uh, the most efficient solution which we see is actually trading. So this is uh, also one of uh, uh, the solutions uh, discussed here. And, uh, and, and it's, it's really interesting in the sense that uh, here you, you connect a water story and the solution is somewhere, you know, at the WTO uh, 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 desks uh, rather than a technical solution because the technical solutions are not sufficient. Huh? This, this, this we also know. Huh? So, so you have to uh, uh, solve one problem by almost uh, unrelated uh, 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 negotiation table, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's also it's uh, it's it's kind of what you need is, and this goes to the governance. You need to have a, a kind of a global negotiation in order to solve local problems, and I think this is this is also a very important issue, uh, which we also get out of these scenarios. I, I think that we are very consistent in the in the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me 
very shortly go back to the, to the, to the history of scenarios. Uh, scenarios are typically, they come out of military planning. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and France has a very strong tradition on, uh, on uh, doing uh, scenario planning, also because it's a centralized state. Huh? You know, Louis XIV and afterwards. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, and uh, where, and it, this is a little bit of a notion I, I kind of didn't feel yet, is uh, one other function of conducting scenarios is actually to get excitement within your own organization, you know? Uh, uh, Michel said that people were suffering from the scenarios. They should actually be incredibly excited about scenarios because it's one of the unifying visions you can get out of, uh, of this. And then, of course, if these scenarios really excite the organization as such, then you should bring it out to, to the uh, broader public and have a very strong uh, discussion. And I think this is also what's going to happen, of course. Um, uh, uh, when, uh, when I looked at the scenarios, and they are exploratory scenarios, uh, I asked myself also, you could just have given everything to the machine and just run the scenario combinations instead of just uh, looking at these five scenarios. This is very educative, but uh, what one would get out of a good sensitivity analysis would be something what I would call uh, factor decomposition. You get actually then an idea of uh, what's the contribution of diet change in percentage terms uh, compared to technological changes in livestock uh, improvements, compared to what's the contribution of trade uh, in order to achieve a certain food security or environmental goal. And I think this is uh, something, uh, if I were on an external uh, uh, advisory board, I would assist uh, on doing this additional study step uh, to do this, this factor decomposition. And I know there is uh, uh, Jean-Francois Susanna, he elaborated a very detailed methodology to do this, and this is within your own organization, so why not using it? Um, uh, what, I, what I missed a little bit is uh, the brave new technologies. Hmm. Uh, they, they, they're not in there. It's all incremental technologies which we know yet, and uh, to my uh, gusto, it's a little bit uh, pessimistic, especially on the African side. I think that the, the yield gap can be closed uh, much faster than in, in, in your scenarios. Huh? And there are, uh, on the horizon, there are quite a few interesting uh, new technologies. And then, uh, uh, they can be quite disruptive, even to some of the insights you have here. Huh? Um, the other thing, uh, this is more an incremental technology, is digitalization and the impact of digitalization, I think, would really merit a, uh, a separate scenario. Uh, okay. Um, uh, no, 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 it's just uh, in the microphone for the interpreters. Cause yeah, you, they, okay. They hear. okay, okay, okay. Um, then uh, what, uh, what I... Again, coming back to, these, uh, to the sensitivity analysis, um, I think the storylines, we see even all of them within this country and of course in many other countries. You, 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 you see the, 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 the kind of completely urban system, you see the very green system. Uh, so why not com uh, combining it also by geographies and, uh, and then you might actually get out very interesting scenarios because I think those scenarios are really going on at the same time and then see how this, 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 this could evolve over time. Um, uh, then, uh, the question for me is, uh, but this uh, one should discuss afterwards, is really uh, the, the purpose of the scenarios. Is it a kind of finding a proactive strategy? You know, what uh, France and uh, INRA, uh, INRA and, and CIRA should do for, for strategy building? Or is it also in the spirit of trying to formulate something what I would call resilience? And resilience in, in this sense uh, is a strategy, even a research strategy, robust in all of the different scenarios. And I think the scenario results actually uh, point exactly to that direction because uh, what you see is the difference 
between the scenario worlds, the five different scenarios, is actually smaller than the variance you, you get out of the diet shifts and the technologies. So the diet shifts and the technologies are kind of the, the robust strategies across the different scenarios. And I think that's quite important also for strategy building within the organization, um, which comes out of this, uh, uh, this scenario exercise. Um, and then finally, uh, I think, uh, uh, you definitely plan already for, for the next step. Uh, so the next step is, uh, you know, now it's uh, uh, exploratory scenarios. Uh, the next step are uh, policy option assessment. And, uh, and here we are talking about you live in your scenario. Uh, so you live in your urban scenario, but you still would like to uh, uh, obtain certain uh, environmental outcomes which the scenario itself does not give you. And then uh, you need to put in uh, a climate policy, a biodiversity policy, a special uh, social policy in order to, to, to get... Uh, so uh, I think this would be great fun and I hope that uh, the organizations will build these kind of tools uh, in order to go for this next step. And uh, finally, I hope, ah, well, th this, is, this is also interesting. So when you, uh, uh, we are participating in this uh, um, model intercomparison of different agricultural mo models, uh, AGMIP. And what you see is that uh, also there, and this is also very much related to your results, that the, the difference between the models is larger than the, the signal of the scenarios. So you, just like in your case with the technologies and the, and the diet shifts. Um, and uh, so it would be very interesting to do the, the, the scenario exercise which we have seen here uh, with different models and actually see whether we can uh, derive uh, really robust uh, uh, insights uh, out of uh, at least the five scenarios. And uh, for this we will for sure try to get some European money to do this jointly. <laughs> Okay. Bon, uh, vous étiez beaucoup à vouloir prendre la parole. Tout Many of you wanted to speak uh, a while ago. Now, would some of you like to ask questions or to share comments about what you just heard? Bonjour, je suis Sébastien Treyer de uh, scenario uh, advisory was very interesting to hear Mrs. Bonny and Mr. Robert Steiner. The five scenarios that we are trying to achieve is to build a bridge between two approaches. Two approaches. One that's necessary that uh, Michael Obersteiner mentioned that involves global mobilization la, la, for land la, la, use la voir sont les with the ability to see the main factors and all the different combinations and put up some sensitivity analyses. And if I understand what Mrs. Bunning said, is that a lot has to do with uh, local moi, qualitative variables. So what I mean on Terra is trying to show that we have to be able to tell stories and give quantitative illustrations that take into account local, local factors have to do with access to land and big world trends where Big numbers scale make a difference. That's why these are mentioned in the scenarios. For me, things that are inescapable globally. It's very useful to see that Michael is saying that would be useful to use these scenarios in the agri mix. Precisely, and to be able to use these scenarios in the agri mix. Préciser encore un certain nombre de choses, notamment les questions économiques dont Chantal nous a dit qu'elle n'y était pas. Things, et en même temps, on a une invitation like à, à la reste de d'aller voir plus concrètement comment est-ce que ces grands scénarios globaux euh, peuvent avoir des traductions we'll ou, des, ou des incarnations très particulières dans les territoires. Euh, dans les territoires. Et moi, ce que, ce que, ce que, ce que, juste locally. pour conclure, ce n'est pas une question, je suis désolé, mais c'est ce que m'évoque l'écoute de ces différents commentaires. 
Euh, il me semble qu'il y a un pas vraiment important qui est franchi grâce à Agrimontera pour réussir à faire le pont entre ces deux échelles. Si je dois exprimer un point de vue très subjectif, les modélisations globales sur l'usage des terres, pour moi, me posaient la question de ne pas mettre suffisamment en avant la question de gouvernance locale du foncier, d'accès au foncier, qui ne sont pas facilement représentables dans le modèle, qui sont pas facilement représentables dans le modèle, qui ne sont pas facilement représentables dans le modèle, qui ne sont pas facilement représentables dans le modèle. So this is a way of bringing the two together. Oui, madame. Je suis Jenny J. de Prague. I'm Jenny um, J. de Prague. Avec le Global Forum on Agricultural Research Global Forum on Agricultural Research Development, development and uh, retired from Je FAO. suis très contente que plusieurs I'm personnes ont souligné la nécessité de penser beaucoup plus aux aspects humains et aussi plusieurs personnes qui ont dit que la question du foncier n'a pas été très approfondie. Je suis aussi très contente que la question du foncier n'a pas été très approfondie. I work in socioeconomics. I can tell you it's very complicated. And in future works, we must go into this more in depth. Tout à fait invisible. But there's something that's invisible. It's the labor. We spoke of farming systems, but it's the people who farm. And we know very well that the people who farm are the people who farm. And we know that there's flight from the land. But it's mostly young men. So we find more and more older farmers and women farmers. We need to study that. And even in other countries, like in the Middle East, where culturally, Women are veiled or not in the public sphere. Women account for 60 to 65 percent of farming labor in Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, etc. But the problem is if these women do the work, do they also have the decision-making powers? Do they have the decision-making powers? Do they have the decision-making powers? Parce que si elles ne l'ont pas, elles ne peuvent pas investir dans la production. Ou bien elles ne peuvent pas investir dans la production. Ou bien elles ne peuvent pas investir dans la production. From Donc, a Gulf a country and tells them what to do. So there's a lot to be done here. And we have the GFA and other colleagues. And other people I'd like to know. We would like to be involved in this question. Thank you. Est-ce qu'il y a un commentaire par rapport à ce qui vient d'être dit Monsieur, j'ai quelques questions ici. Si vous pouvez vous présenter, puis je vais vous voir. Je m'appelle Adam Faye. Je viens du Sénégal. J'ai eu la chance de participer au comité de revue sur les scénarios. Et je dois dire qu'il y a eu un excellent travail qui a été fait et qui a permis quand même d'arriver à ces scénarios. Bon, comme l'a dit Patrick, ces scénarios ne peuvent pas être atteindre un certain degré de, de finesse pour prendre en charge toute la variabilité et la diversité qui caractérise euh, l'objet de cette prospective. Et euh, je ne vais pas reprendre à mon compte ce que je viens d'entendre. Je crois que l'homme sera toujours au centre de tout. Comment les sociétés en question sont organisées Quels sont leurs valeurs Comment les aspirations à certains changements Cela restera extrêmement déterminant parce que c'est ce qui a déterminé historiquement les choix que les sociétés ont faits et ce travail ne pourra se faire que si on contextualise ces scénarios, c'est-à-dire qu'on essaie de les valider, de tester leur sensibilité, la sensibilité plutôt des scénarios au niveau où, effectivement, on compte les appliquer. Voilà ce que je voulais dire, et je suis désolé qu'on n'est pas nombreux ici africains, parce que nous, effectivement... <laughs> on est extrêmement intéressé par ça. La vie uh, est au cœur des enjeux qui sont soulignés. La sécurité us. alimentaire, l'accès à la terre. Bon, euh, dans l'élevage, on n'a pas beaucoup parlé de, uh, du pastoralisme. Aujourd'hui, le pastoralisme est un, un, un problème extrêmement important en Afrique. 
which is a very Il est au cœur de beaucoup de guerres qui se mènent et right cela ne fait qu'aller de l'avant parce que le cycle augmente, déjà augmente, etc. Bon, je ne veux pas trop parler, mais je crois qu'il y a encore du travail à faire. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Michael, uh, you wanted to uh, add something to that. Uh, Michael, yeah, well, there's, there's a lot ongoing in, in Africa. Oui, uh, 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 I only know from our own uh, experiences, uh, there is uh, CCAF, so this, these are the CGR centers. Uh, they did uh, some uh, Western African uh, scenarios, Eastern African scenarios, uh, and there is also this network, and I think this is, comes out of CIRAD uh, uh, also, is this AgriDep, where you do, where you, it's a, it's a modeling network uh, to do policy impact assessment, and, uh, uh, and we had the pleasure together also with, uh, with CIRAD some, some time ago to think about uh, avoided deforestation scenarios in the Congo Basin. So, so there's a lot going on and uh, you for sure have Donc participated in quite many. many. Um, um, but coming back also to, uh, to the intervention on, uh, intervention on women, but even more human resources femme, overall, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting issue. On the one hand, you have a uh, uh, shortage of labor, côté, uh, Russia, for example, but even in, in, in uh, regions where you have excess of labor, you also have a uh, shortage of qualified labor. Um, and uh, last time I was in Paris, I, I met uh, Bruno Dorin, and he showed me some terrifying uh, scenarios, on the, especially on India, uh, because if you apply labor productivity of uh, Europe to India, then all in a sudden, uh, uh, 300 million to 500 million uh, people who are dependent directly on agriculture are actually not needed anymore. And I think uh, now in, in, the, in the scenarios of uh, mass migration, we're just seeing the first little wave of ma 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 mass migration. But if we don't make the transition from a human point of view of the agricultural, you know, of the next wave of of, uh, let's say, second uh, green revolution, uh, then uh, we create a big social mess. Um, if I may, I'd like to also add a couple of points. And um, I think one of the problems in doing such scenarios is the um, weakness of some of the statistics and data. And certainly FAO is trying to um, improve the data sets and there's going to be coming out quite very short. Um, some new information on um, dry lands and especially on uh, things like biomass, tree cover, etc., which shows that actually there's many more trees and forests in the world than we thought there were because with Google and with the high resolution um, tools that are available now, we can do much more detailed analysis. And this is revolutionizing, in fact, how we do assessments on grasslands, rangelands, dry lands. Um, uh, whatever. So in the next couple of years, there will be much better data that can be fed into such models. Um, I think one of the areas we should be looking at, which is something that we highlighted in a State of the World report on land and water um, systems in about 2002, the SOLAW study, um, was the need to really focus on systems at risk, which one are the ones that are more vulnerable. And if we look at the Middle East region and the scarcity of water and the population pressure uh, and the fact that uh, land per capita is, is actually, potential land for agriculture per capita is extremely low, there are certain areas in the world that really are going to have to be importing and other regions in the world that are going to have to increase their production huge hugely to meet the world demand. And I think this is going to really um, uh, hopefully change the investment um, world in terms of investing much more in sub-Saharan Africa to bring about more um, sustainable production systems because we all know the yields are at the moment much, much lower than they could be in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so there are, um, there are 
there are changes that are going to happen, Donc, and, but I think we do need more investment in the data. And um, fortunately, with the Global Soil Partnership, we've been um, receiving much more recognition of the need to invest in soil data, also because of the climate change scenarios on soil organic matter. And I think in another uh, two years, there'll be much better data si on soil organic carbon uh, and uh, de, de other aspects as well. Uh, um, that's, that's on one side on the, the data to exemple. feed such models and scenarios. Obviously, a lot comes from people's knowledge, la but it also is very helpful if it's backed up by good science. Um, the other the question is resilience. I fully agree with the comment that was made that um, resilience in, is going to be crucial in the future um, with the the climate uh, um, variability and we're seeing wherever we go in the world now um, erratic uh, rainfall, much more extreme events and I think that this means that we're going to have in to invest more in small scale irrigation, to invest more in um, diversification towards uh, legumes and uh, crops which are more resilient, uh, sorghum uh, and other varieties in saline areas. Um, so really to address the, the, the problem problem soils, problem areas. So um, it would be wonderful to really join. There's a, there's a study coming out very shortly in FAO, and I can't remember the, the study agricultural um, uh, 2020, um, Agriculture Transformation 2020 or something, and in, in that study, I'll, I'll let you know, um, uh, Madame Delatre Gasquet, um, but there's, there's quite a lot of more information on the um, information learned from the global greenhouse gas emissions database and um, more recent work on um, climate modeling. Um, so my final comment then is um, let's all continue to work together and see how we can um, you know, test some of these, these models in different countries and through doing analysis with, with decision makers and strengthen the, the, the work and I think it's a very, um, we, well, we'd like to really give a warm um, clap to the work that's been done so far. It's very interesting and uh, it, I'm sure it will help um, to bring together better cooperation among um, not just uh, research organizations, but cooperation with research development to the government and civil society organizations. So um, keep up the work. So continue your work. Euh, Michel Griffon, je Michel Griffon. voudrais dire que le travail qui nous a été présenté euh, est contenu dans un univers dans lequel on a la démographie, les besoins alimentaires, le, la production les surfaces, production, les surfaces area, et c'est à l'intérieur de ce système que l'on a réfléchi. In this system, uh, we, the, the analysis was conducted. It was extended to climate change, uh, which is an important external variable. It could have included also biodiversity, which is uh, central to the future. Mais il y a of agriculture. Il faudrait peut-être prendre en compte But other external variables may need to be taken into account in the future. La variable du, de l'emploi, de la productivité du travail, comme Michael Oberstein a pointed out for India. Dans le cas de l'Afrique, uh, la révolution numérique the digital revolution uh, est actuellement en train de produire des accroissements is de production quand on fait une projection démographique en 2050 et plus loin encore, et further, si l'on suppose que la libéralisation de l'économie mondiale va continuer, je sais qu'il y a des beaucoup d'arrêts, mais on peut supposer qu'elle va continuer et qu'il y aura des délocalisations d'emplois, 
and that the, there will be offshoring of jobs. Those jobs that go to India, Bangladesh, and later Africa, which is the future place for low-cost labor, these jobs will be highly productive. If we relocate car factories, they won't be built like in 1920 or 1930. There will be modern cars on highly, on highly in highly productive factories. So we think we're expecting 3.6 billion Africans. How will they all work with, with high productive jobs? Keeping in mind, you have to feed everyone. So we might wonder whether there won't be scenarios where people actually return to the land. So access to land, land ownership may become a key problem in Africa. Less for India, but still. And if we're not going to face serious risks, because part of the civil wars in Africa over the last 20 or 30 years had to do with access to land. In the Sahel, for instance, populations moving towards western coastal areas. So I think this excellent study presented needs to open up to more determining variables, access to land, labor productivity included. Thank you. I can take one comment or one question and then a few words of conclusion from our panel. I'm Hugo Valin. I also work at AESA and Michael Bersteiner's team. Sorry, that doesn't increase the diversity of viewpoints. But I thought this was a very interesting study and uh, I'm involved in a lot of model comparison and agricultural models in Europe and comparison of models on GHG impacts on climate. I can say there's a comparative advantage here that uh, comes out quite strongly what IRED and CERED can do together. With all this data from research institutions that are very important, you realize this. There are very few such large institutions such as IRED and CERED working on this. France remains a big agricultural country. And we see this in these cases. We're missing information. The most important aspect of the scenarios has to do with production systems, both in cropping and uh, livestock breeding. It would be good to hear about this in the international communities working on these issues. Two small comments quickly now. Keep in mind that Food security is first an economic problem rather than a problem of availability, whereas in 2050, we'll have to see whether the price of food, access to the market or local production at an affordable cost and in conditions is going to be very important. And we should be able to include these aspects in these studies to really be able to assess food security. And secondly, about land and how it's represented in such an approach. There are many uncertainties about data, as was said. As we can see here, there's a lot of uh, land, farmland expansion to the terrestrial of forests. Remember that in the FAO data, when we speak of uh, cropland or grassland, a lot in that category is not used intensively. If I take the example of the US, where statistics are good, what FAO calls crop land, well, 30% of that is not cultivated. Why? 
temporairement comme pâturage. Ça peut être de la terre euh, qui est en temporairement en jachère, ou ça peut être de la terre qui est placée en programme de conservation. Euh, ce qui veut dire que lorsqu'aux états unis euh, on, 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 on a un débat sur la discussion de l'Université, ça va par exemple sur est-ce que on réduit euh, les surfaces en conservation. Donc, la déforestation peut intervenir évidemment euh, plus tard, mais il y a quand même aussi une euh, exploitation dans les terres euh, par Merci beaucoup. Nous touchons à, à la fin de cette table ronde. Vous avez des petites remarques de conclusion. Euh, juste pour terminer, deux minutes chacun par rapport à ce que la salle a dit et, et pour conclure. Deux minutes, si vous pouvez. Ok, c'est une courte conclusion. Donc. Uh, voilà, moi je, je voulais juste euh, dire que la, la, la seule chose qu'on peut faire, c'est abonder The only thing we can do is agree euh, with what sur la question de la sécurité alimentaire, qui est avant tout une question économique, une question de pauvreté, et donc effectivement c'est la question de l'emploi, euh, et de l'emploi en dehors du secteur agricole pour ceux qui veulent avoir un emploi en dehors du secteur agricole, et donc de l'accès à la terre et de l'accès à des moyens de production, par contre pour euh, ceux qui restent dans le secteur agricole. And, so um, et j'ai envie de dire qu'à ce niveau, Là, le, le travail de scénario ici est so assez riche. Je pense que c'est un peu au début. Il faut aller respect, euh, euh, lire dans les, les, les détails, etc. Euh, les scénarios sont, sont riches et permettent de réfléchir à, à beaucoup déjà de ces aspects en termes d'emploi, de, de diversification, de la, du lien entre la, la, la productivité du travail et, le, et la quantité d'emplois qui peut offrir l'agriculture, etc. Euh, là où il euh, y a un, un manque, c'est c'est euh, plus largement dans la quantification, donc d'arriver à, à, à intégrer ce genre d'éléments-là dans des modèles, euh, euh, dans des modèles comme celui à ça ou autre, dans la quantification qui a été faite ici, évidemment, mais ça, bon, voilà, on, on savait que le, ça allait être assez limité à ce niveau-là. Mais voilà, pour moi, le, le challenge, c'est d'arriver à intégrer ce type d'éléments-là dans des modèles de ce type euh, d'assessement ou, ou des choses comme ça. Et alors, je voulais juste revenir un tout petit peu sur la question de la, la sensibilité. Alors, l'objectif ici, je pense, c'est pas nécessairement d'arriver à cette décomposition de facteurs uh, plutôt d'aller voir justement la, la cohérence et factors. parce que là ça we peut aussi être utile euh, dans le sens où euh, faire une analyse de sensibilité où on va faire varier les, les degrés de liberté euh, dans tous les sens quelque part n'a pas beaucoup d'intérêt parce que c'est ce qu'on voit ici quelque part useful. dans les résultats des scénarios c'est qu'il y a des liens de causalité il y a des structures qui sont en place et donc N'importe quel type de régime alimentaire n'est pas logiquement compatible avec n'importe quel type de système. Not every food system is compatible with every farming or trade system. L'intérêt aussi pour moi des scénarios tels qu'ils sont ici, c'est de pouvoir montrer à une équipe qui a peut-être des capacités plus poussées en termes de quantification et d'analyse de sensibilité, quels sont les degrés de liberté qu'on peut faire varier les uns par rapport aux autres, et quels sont les degrés de liberté qu'on peut laisser fixes dans un scénario, parce que la cohérence interne du scénario fait qu'il n'y a pas vraiment de sens à faire varier ce degré de liberté là. Merci beaucoup, Patrick. Uh, yes, I'd just like to come back to the question, Je voudrais really revenir à la question de la disponibilité um, des terres. Les, la zone cultivée a augmenté de 12% au cours des 50 dernières années et la production a augmenté deux à trois, de 2 à 3 fois. Pourquoi Parce que c'est utilisé pour... Les terres sont utilisées pour, euh, de, de, pour le pâturage, euh, pour l'élevage, pour d'autres objectifs. Comment répondre à, la de, à 70 d'augmentation de la demande agricole par l'intensification, ce qui inclut l'agroécologie Il faut réunir l'agroécologie et l'intensification durable pour que ça devienne une chose, des systèmes intégrés qui produisent de une alimentation diversifiée localement pour que ce soit plus facilement disponible à ceux qui en ont besoin. Il y a, vrai, il y a des problèmes dans le monde. La population en Asie augmente, spécialement en Asie du Sud-Est. 
et bien sûr en Afrique subsaharienne. Et si on, il faut faire investir les politiques en agriculture durable, sinon on n'aura pas de transformation dans la bonne direction. Et ça créera plus de conflits et d'instabilité dans le monde. Les ressources agricoles sont déjà sous pression, ainsi que l'eau. Et puis, la perte de biodiversité aussi. Est-ce la bonne approche de continuer avec ces stratégies de production des biocarburants, des céréales pour les biocarburants Ces questions devront être soulevées. Il faut plus investir dans l'énergie solaire et d'autres sources d'énergie renouvelables si l'on veut espérer vivre dans un monde en paix à l'avenir et protéger nos ressources et que tout le monde soit heureux. Merci Sally. Michael, pour revenir à Hugo, l'INRA et le CIRAD, They have a dominating global role to play. ont un rôle And, uh, just, uh, essentiel à jouer à l'échelle mondiale. Germany, Il y a trois semaines, en Allemagne, lors d'un atelier sur le lancement des objectifs de développement durable, uh, INRA in CIRAD, what do these scenarios Tell eh bien, us ces what scénarios nous disent do ce que l'INRA et le CIRAD doivent faire France. en France, by France uh, one, uh, par la France. Uh, present you gave to the word, that's for example, 4 pour 1000. Uh, Thank you very much, Alexis. Exactly on time. Donc, merci beaucoup.